The question is, what do we do with our money in this world? Where does it make sense to invest with this much volatility, this much uncertainty? Yeah, it's really been a challenging time for investors, and it really depends what sort of time frame uh, you have as an investor. You know, if, if you're in retirement, uh, what you probably need is some assurance that uh, you're going to be able to get the cash flow you need off of your portfolio. And so one of the things we've done for, for our clients in that kind of a situation is to create portfolios with above average dividend yields mm -hmm. on the one side. And now as bond yields are rising and we've kept our duration relatively short, we've been able to let bonds mature and then re-up at higher yields. So, you know, one area to go to is uh, some relatively stable companies, whether it's General Mills or an AbV or, uh, you know, some of the others in consumer staples and in energy that have, you know, dividend yields in the 4, 5, 6% range. And that way they can still get that income and they can ride out the volatility in the stock prices and wait this out. And, and that gives our clients a fair bit of comfort. But, you know, it hasn't been easy really for anybody, but that's one way to deal with the volatility. Lizanne, what are you recommending these days? Well, first of all, I, I absolutely agree with Joanne that there's no there's no cookie cutter answer to a question like that. It really does depend on who the investor is, their risk tolerance, their past experience, their time horizon, whether their financial risk tolerance and their emotional risk tolerance, whether there's a narrow gap between the two or a wide gap between the two. But I think we're in the, a, a part of the market cycle right now where you want to actually focus on fundamentals. And I, I know that sounds trite and sounds what we're always supposed to do, but Gone are the days where you could look at segments of the market, components of, say, big tech, and look at it monolithically, make an assumption that they're all going to go up uh, simultaneously. There's much more differentiation in the market right now. And I'd say look for where things are dear from a macro perspective. So we have declining earnings revisions in the aggregate. So look for the factor around positive earnings revisions, positive earnings surprise. We know we're in a rising interest rate environment. So companies with strong balance sheets, uh, low debt, high cash flow, strong free cash flow, um, uh, low, lower volatility. It's just kind of a quality wrapper. And I think that's the best type of approach uh, in this environment. And then the last thing we've suggested for those investors who, who can do it, if you were a rebalancer based on the calendar, maybe instead of doing it once a year, once a quarter, let your portfolio and the volatility associated with dictate the timing of, of taking advantage of the volatility by you know, adding into weakness, trimming into strength relative to your overall uh, strategic asset allocation. Joanne, what about uh, the possibility of fixed income at this point? I mean, for a long time, you didn't want to be in bonds, given what was going on in bonds. But those yields have really come up. They're yielding something now, and they do generate cash. I mean, it's sort of like dividends, right? Yeah, absolutely right. You know, we're getting uh, in the order of 6-plus percent in, in yields in our all-investment-grade uh, uh, fixed income solution. And when you pair that with in a balanced strategy with the equity front, you know, you can generate a pretty nice cash flow for clients. Um, and so if you keep duration short and you're really careful about selecting credit quality, because credit spreads have widened here, so you want to be careful that you're not adding risk to the side of your portfolio that is supposed to be sort of the suspenders on the pants, right, mm -hmm. to, to provide more stability. And so that's one thing we've done, and, it, and it's helped our clients feel a lot more comfortable in this kind of environment. Lizanne, are you to the point yet where you'd consider duration, that is going longer duration yeah. for fixed income? So my, my colleague, Kathy Jones, who's a regular guest on, uh, on Bloomberg, she's our fixed income strategist. And in the sort of four-ish percent range, we have suggested you can consider lengthening uh, duration. But I, I agree with everything that Joanne said, too. I think there are finally opportunities. You know, we've gone from a, from a Tina environment, there is no, no alternative, to TIA, there is an alternative, and there's income and fixed income again, and there are strategies, a bit more active strategies that you can employ to take advantage of this move up in uh, yields. Even well down the duration spectrum, you're actually generating a yield. And if inflation ever came down, um, we might actually have positive real yields. We're not quite there yet, but I think we'll get there. Well, you know, Lizanne, I want to pick up, that was exactly the point I was going to make, is the challenge is that inflation is so high that even if you're getting those appealing yields on fixed income, you're still losing purchasing power. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we you know, continue to counsel if, if the client has appropriate risk tolerances and time horizon, the equity side can help you offset the cost of inflation. You know, for example, one of the stocks in, in one of these portfolios is McDonald's. Now what you want is to find a company like that, that has good cash flow that can continue to pay its dividend, but more importantly even, can raise its dividend year after year. 
and they just announced this week a 10% increase in their dividend. So you're being compensated, more than compensated, for that cost of inflation eroding the purchasing power of your money. And that's something that you're more likely to get on the equity side than you are on the, on the fixed income side. Lizanne, we're spending so much time on rates and on growth and, for that matter, geopolitics and things like Ukraine. What about earnings? We are in earnings season now. We had the first four banks come out this week with their earnings, which actually were pretty <laughs> reassuring to a lot of people. Is there a possibility that could help the investor right now to the upside? It's possible. I think the rub, though, is that even if we end reporting season with um, some sort of positive beat rate, we have to recognize that estimates have been coming down since the April-May period of time, both for the second half of 2022 and the first half of 2023. So it, is, it has been a lowered bar. And much like the second quarter, we're still early, but expectations are that energy pretty much is all the earnings growth. So mm. consensus right now, once the quarter is all said and done, a month from now or so, you'll have 3% overall S&P earnings growth. But you exclude energy, that goes down to minus 3%. And and that's if, if that's the case, that would be worse uh, than the second quarter. And I think the path of least resistance for estimates is still down. I'd also say really important to watch and listen in earnings season, not just for did you beat your numbers or your profit margins, what's your profit margin outlook. If you're a multinational company, the impact of the incredibly strong dollar, whether you're hedging it or not, the impact of inflation, whether you have a lot of fixed costs or variable costs, what your labor costs are. So I think it's a lot of the, the details under the surface that are matter as much as just the top line reading. Joanne, are you taking into account earnings right now in your investment decisions? What are you anticipating? Well, you know, estimates have come down a lot, you know, as Lizanne was saying. Uh, the real question, I think, around this earnings season is going to be guidance. And given the uncertainty and the real risks that are out there, I think companies are going to be extremely cautious. And, and I think investors expect that. It's really kind of a waiting game. We don't know if, when, how large a recession will be, how broad it will be. So we're going to, investors are going to look to companies to get some clues about that. The companies that are out there on the ground, whether it's a Texas Instruments providing chips to the auto industry, you know, or a company providing uh, chips to Apple. And, and that guidance, I think investors are going to learn from. And I don't think they're going to hope for too much. I think we're expecting uh, not very uh, strong guidance uh, for the fourth quarter. I think a lot of companies are going to defer and say, we're going to be more cautious. We're going to cut some costs. We're preparing for things to slow down. And that's, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to change your investment allocations, though. Because if you're in it, not for the next six months, but you're in it for a couple years, three years, five years. Right now we have a, a, a lot of stocks that have become relatively inexpensive. Yep.